I V M. Before you listen to this episode of the Seen and the Unseen, I have a recommendation for you. Do check out Pulya Bazi, hosted by Saurabh Chandra and Pranay Kotesane, two really good friends of mine. Kickass podcast in Hindi. It's amazing. In 2014, when the BJP swept the general elections, commentators spoke about the Modi wave. Some people were stunned by the size of this wave, but maybe they would not have been so surprised if they'd followed the cultural, social, and political currents behind this wave. Narendra Modi's rise to power did not start in 2002 when the Gujarat riots happened, or 1992 when the Babri Masjid was demolished in Ayodhya. or even 1980 when the bjp was founded these currents in some form or another go back decades if not centuries they started gathering force and were given direction around a century ago and it was such a well organized well thought out powerful force that i am surprised that we didn't have a hindu rashtra long long ago the book that i will discuss on the show today is ostensibly a book of history but it will reveal the true nature of modern india more than almost any other book you can find in the market welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics politics and behavioral science please welcome your host amit varma welcome to the seen and the unseen i'm honored to have the journalist and author akshay mukul as my guest today and we'll be chatting about his brilliant book geeta press and the making of hindu india there's been a common question asked in recent years sometimes with genuine curiosity and sometimes with mockery where are the intellectuals of the right wing i explored this question myself in an episode i did a few months ago called the intellectual foundations of hindutva where i chatted with akar patel who is writing a book on the hindu rashtra At the end of the episode Akar and I concluded that there isn't really much there. On reading Akshay's book I realized that we were perhaps too glib. There is an organized intellectual tradition within the Hindutva movement and there has been coherence and consistency over the decades. Maybe people like me have discounted it because our first language is English and we don't read the Hindi press. and maybe we discounted it because we have such contempt for the founding principles of this tradition that we hesitate to call it intellectual either way it's our mistake and our loss without understanding these intellectual currents i don't believe we can understand india and we will continue to be surprised election after election as our elite little bubble continues to count for nothing also all our talk of getting our ideas into the culture stand for nothing if we cannot understand our culture in the first place and the forces that shaped it geeta press and the making of hindu india is an eye opening book but before i begin my conversations with akshay let's take a quick commercial break did you know that parsis in mumbai instead of being left at the tower of silence after they die are now cremated and why because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal but 3? One of them was seen but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Verma and in my weekly podcast The Seen and the Unseen I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action I speak to experts on economics political philosophy cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind but also yours The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday so do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in you can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer Akshay welcome to The Seen and the Unseen thank you Amit for having me Akshay tell me a little bit about yourself how did you become a journalist how did your journey start uh i grew up in rachi I'm originally from Bihar, but I grew up in Ranchi, which is now Jharkhand. Uh, so it was, uh, it's a very cosmopolitan, I grew up in an industrial township. Uh, and we grew up uh, without getting too much affected by caste or religion. Because, you know, for years I had Goan neighbors or Garwali neighbors. Because, you know, this is how industrial towns are. 
and uh, I studied there till my plus two, which is I did intermediate, went to Javier's College there, and then I came to Delhi University where I studied history. I majored in history, and then, well, like everyone from Bihar or that part of the world, tries a hand at civil services, which I did one attempt. And then I thought, no, that's there's something. Uh, maybe I'm. It's not for me. I, I I just couldn't clear it. I just couldn't even clear prelims. So I went for. I thought journalism. I tried journalism. I went to IMC, and then I joined. I worked four places. Started with Asian Age, which was just launched, and it was like talk of the town. It was one of the biggest thing to happen in the early nineties. Uh, then worked in Pioneer. For three and a half years, then it such so in a way changed hands. Then I moved to Hindustan Times, where I worked for exactly two years, and then Times of India, where I worked for almost seventeen years. And uh, then now I kind of quit. Now I'm off journalism. I quit in two thousand seventeen, and since then I'm kind of unknown now. And 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 what kind of journalism attracted you? Well, journalism. Uh, when I had grown up reading all kinds of uh, journalism. I, I'm talking of M. J. Akbar of those days, not the M. J. Akbar of now. But he was editing Telegraph, and growing up in Ranchi, and Telegraph was launched, and it was in the paper in Ranchi always normally comes in the evening. Uh, but one waited for that paper. One even waited for Indian Express or Times of India, which all came in the evening because there were no Patna editions, no other editions. So Delhi edition will come by air and will come in the evening. Uh, one was really attracted to the kind of journalism which was happening those days. With uh, you know, Bhagalpur blindings happened. Arun Sori was there, M. J. Akbar was there, and these were people were taking on the establishment. And uh, when I joined profession in uh, late ninety three, early ninety four, uh, these people were still there. Arun Sori was no longer working in active journalism, but uh, Akbar was. I was I joined his paper. Other people, Chandan Mitra, other people who one had grown up reading. So there was this whole thing on this right on the genuine issues of the country, right on the politics, and it was a phase when Congress was dominating. And although it was like the fag end of Congress dominance, but still Congress was very much the dominating force. And there was this whole larger alliance of anti-Congressism happening, socialists, leftists, even BJP, all of them were coming together. So it was a very, very interesting phase when I joined um, journalism. I remember in '93, uh, one of the uh, this '94, in fact, this uh, Andhra election was taking place, and this was a uh, one big election. I think uh, Chandrababu Naidu had. Uh, managed to come back. This, it was. I remember it was a big election. Then, of course, that was a phase of instability. We saw governments after governments come and go from eighty nine onwards. Only five years of Narsimara was five stable years. Other were ninety six, ninety eight, ninety nine, and then the stability. Now we are in a stable phase. And one saw all that. You know, I was in HT when uh, Kargil happened. Uh, I covered Kargil in a very different way. I covered post Kargil. I traveled. I remember from Meerut to Teri Garwal, Pori Garwal, just talking, going to the families which had lost the children, the sons, brothers, you know, husbands, and uh, the whole futility of war, what goes in the family. One could see it firsthand, and a lot more things were happening uh, in terms of. Religious politics, because you know, ninety two had was very fresh. Ninety two had happened. Politics had gone for a complete change. Mandal had happened. So it was very, very. Uh, we saw United Front government. Uh, we saw six years of um, Bajpayee rule, the ninety nine, and then he again uh, ninety eight, fourteen months, and then five years uh, from ninety nine to two thousand four. And I covered. I started basically as a feature writer. I was writing on arts and culture, and I must have interviewed all the writers, poets, painters you can think of. And because Pioneer was one of the only paper those days uh, which had a dedicated arts page five days a week, and it was a very serious arts page. Very very serious people were writing. Very serious columnists were there, and uh, we we got really into the subject. So and then we had a very good weekend paper for which I wrote a lot. 
then I moved to writing more and more on politics while I was still there. And uh, while I moved to HD, it was again part of the Sunday team, but it was writing more on politics. And that's where I covered, uh, I had a lot of experience doing varied things. For instance, I... Uh, much before this Gujarat thing, I remember doing a full page on Gujarat as Hindutva laboratory. Uh, and they were outraged that how are you saying this? And this was way back in 99. Wow. Then I did uh, on this whole how they were trying to, what they're trying to do with syllabus, uh, NCRT syllabus. And I remember Murli Manohar Joshi getting very hassled about it. He was HRD minister. I did a lot on, I wrote on the Narmada Bachao Andolan, which was in a very crucial phase, which was kind of in a way disintegrating. You know, it was the, that was the last rally for the valley, I remember in 99 or early 2000. So uh, we did a lot of interesting stuff. And then I came to Daily Grind in Times of India, where I was covering uh, political parties, parliament, I was doing a dedicated ministry like HRD ministry or culture ministry, which gave you a ringside view of how government functions, what happens, how decisions are taken or not taken, how made, unmade. And parliament, of course, teaches you, uh, you see closely how legislation happens, how things work, how politicians, how political parties come together on certain issues, how so on certain issues whatever might be the rhetoric outside, deep within, they're all together, you know. So you see all those things happening very closely. So it was a very, very good, very enriching experience. And I was lucky to work with some of the very, very good editors, you know. I worked with Bharat Bhushan, I worked with Chandan Mitra, I worked with uh, Beat Sangvi for a while in Hindustan Times. In HD, I had all... Uh, but Gonkar was just kind of in the last... Uh, days of Padgaukar in, in, in times of India. But yeah, one knew him, one could always go up to him. Uh, then we had people like Siddharth Vardarajan, Manoj Joshi, you know, so it was a very, very good. Later on, changes happened in times of India around 2004, early 2004, because somewhere BJP, I think it was a complete coup. A lot of people had to move out and the people who was considered very close to the government took over. But then the election they lost, <laughs> and uh, and after that, and one has actually I consider two thousand four and two thousand nine actually the UPA two. That's when uh, it started deteriorating, and now in two thousand fourteen, I was very much there when Modi came to power, and you could see for the first time. You know, you're always second guessing the your boss, political bosses. You're thinking what was happening, not happening. Which is not to say that it was not happening during Congress regime. I know of Congress ministers who would constantly buzzer editors and owners saying that why my particular kind of picture gets published. Please ensure that it never comes out again. But uh, it's become far worse now. It's happening at a different level altogether. I had a young political scientist on my show a few weeks ago called Rahul Verma, yeah. and um, who's just written this book called Ideology and Identity. And 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 uh, Rahul made the very interesting point that because he grew up essentially reading Hindi newspapers every day, hmm. he got a very different view of India from what his peers have today. And I'm just wondering that in your case, uh, you grew up in Ranchi, and obviously. Uh, your Hindi is excellent because, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, a, my family has been a very bilingual family has been mm. a stress. So that's how I got used to Hindi literature. I read Hindi literature a lot mm. when I was growing up. I continue to and I feel uh, we have added this completely false uh, sense of I don't know what to call it but by, you know, reading Hindi or reading any other language. It's not about Hindi reading. I have Telugu friends who uh, my generation who are kind of regret their children not reading. I regret my daughter not reading Hindi mm. as much. Uh, I don't know, maybe I tried too much, maybe I didn't try enough, maybe there was something wrong, but I feel very bad that the children all coming up as single language, mm. English speaking people. So that way, yes, I was lucky. What Rahul told you, he's absolutely right. Your your sensibilities, your the way you see the world completely changes because Hindi newspapers, Hindi literature introduce you to world which exists, which we, and we are not aware of, you know. For instance, say someone reading a book like Rag Darbari, 
I must have read it. Uh, I think when I was just out of school or something, and uh, so nothing after that. Nothing shocks you, you know. Here yeah. you feel that okay, this is so true. He was, you know, uh, and and you realize the power of literature, the power of literature more you know, than any other yeah, work of nonfiction. Nothing, right? Absolutely, absolutely, it, it totally you know? nails it. In fact, uh, Rahul and I discuss Raghur Bari also. Yeah, but it, that's a, when you see this India that we are inhabiting now, you realize that oh. God, you know, just see this. How I, I met Sirlal Sukhul much, much later, and I, I, I just couldn't imagine. Yeah, he was a man who was um, had a great sense of humor, and and he was. I was kind of trying to ask him, uh, what is the process? How 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 did he, he said? You know, I was just he he was an administrator, so he had seen India and he had a added perspective to how things work, what happens. So he brought everything there, and and, and nothing has changed. Yeah, this is the India of Sri Lal Sukhul yeah. Rag Darbar is not changed at all. If you ask me, nothing has changed. All of those fundamental things, the way the bureaucracy works, the way people think, it's yeah, just just nothing flat changes. out the same. So I, I I can't help but ask you that okay so you know you went to college and you did a degree in history mm. and uh, typically people of my generation and earlier generations what we did a degree on we just happened to do it it wasn't really a real interest degree karo uske baad jo karna hai karo mm-hmm. and uh, but in your case there is this interesting symmetry that you do a degree in history and you spend these decades in journalism and then you write this great book of history see my uh, I have been a kind of history junkie I have been kind of uh, I have been genuinely interested in history. And in fact, a lot of my friends who are in academics, they always joke that you know when a new book comes on history, he probably buys or reads before us, you know. Mm. So I have this; my entire money goes in books. That's all I've done in life. If someone asks me, I've done nothing but only bought books. Pretty much the same, actually. Yeah. So nothing. I have, I'll leave behind nothing, just books. And I have been genuinely interested reading new kinds of history, what is happening worldwide, new trends. and one can see how the history writing also changed the time when i was in college to subsequently and then some books completely kind of like for instance this book that i'm talking about francis corsini's in the public something is i'm get, not getting the title right uh, and then uh, vasudha dalmia's book on nationalization of hindu tradition on banaras uh you find that this is that saying something which is first time uh, history writing or in, don't want to call it history don't call it it's a kind of a literary history of a different kind of things which no one bothered about your history books never told you and they're talking about creation of mindsets how mindsets became what they become you know what we are seeing now so basuda dalmias is a great book which talks of how this whole thing started in a city like banaras the role of bhartendu harishchandra francis corsini takes it even forward charu gupta comes who brings out if you ever thought that hindi literature was all about nationalism or patriotism and everything see talks of sexuality obscenity in hindi literature not literature is even talking about journals and it's a path breaking book actually and then you grow up in a place where you see that geeta press is there all the time you know uh, in any ordinary hindu household they need not be rabidly communal or anything it's a very secular household it was coming it was coming for your grandparents someone was reading somewhere you know and if you ask anyone everyone knew about geeta press and everyone had their own story about geeta press so then you realize uh, so in fact before it started working on it i asked i remember wendy doniger Uh, that why did she never work on it hmm. she said well i'm not interested uh, so much that aspect of this thing but it's a very good idea and just then before that there's another story in called ulrich stark she did a brilliant book on naval kishore press hmm. of lucknow kanpur and uh, it's an amazing book on the history of this press So I kept wondering that how come there's nothing in Gita Press? Everyone reads about Gita Press, and that got me thinking. That got me inside Gita Press, and uh, I could easily relate to it. In fact, a lot of my friends, you know, in fact, Basuda also asked me this: that how could you relate to this? I could relate to it also because, as you said right in the beginning, 
you know because of reading this multiple things in languages hindi so you know that was not a kind of alien thing i didn't have any problem uh, thinking about working on geeta press it was not something you know formidable for me yeah and and in a sense a book is i mean much more than the a uh, history of a printing press it's also to me the history of the whole yeah. hindutva movement it's in a sense bits of it are also a very fascinating sociological study of marwaris yeah, yeah. and how their social position yeah, changed absolutely. and of course they absolutely. were the main people behind yeah. the kita press were marwaris yeah. Yeah. and i was staggered at one point when i came across these figures in your book i'll just quote them as of february 2014 71.9 million copies of the Gita have been sold. Uh, this is uh, mm. Gita Press publications mm. for the Ram Charit Manas and other works by Goswami Tulsi Das. The figure is 70 million copies, yeah. while 19 million copies of the Puranas, Upanishads, and ancient scriptures have been sold. Then there are the tracts and monographs on the duties of ideal Hindu women and children, of which 94.8 million copies have been sold so far, while more than 65 million copies of stories from India's mythic past, biography. fees of saints and devotional songs have been bought stop quote and uh, you know you also for example uh, talking about every year they used to bring out these special issues yeah, devoted they do, on yeah, something they do, yeah. and uh, talking about in 1938 they got out manasank which was yeah. ram charit manas and there you write quote the very first print run was of 40600 copies and by late 1983 a total of 5.69 million copies had been printed a record unparalleled in the work of indian publishing stop quote and uh, uh, you know maybe i should be ashamed of this but i had no idea that something so uh, well if you <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> see in fact this is a friend of mine uh, from rachi uh who grew up differently I, that's all i tell him i tease him he said how come i was not aware then i said why don't you ask your parents maybe ask your mother uh, she'll be aware of it and he said no even she won't be aware i said no try it then he found out that yes they knew somehow he was not interested his interests lie elsewhere so you know it's about but you know i can safely tell you while i was working on it there's and i have friends across who work across professions you know friends who are like very in corporate world from university years and if you tell them geeta press the brand recall itself told me the story that even if they don't know anything about geeta press they know about geeta they know of they've heard of geeta press and as far as these numbers even i was staggered and i took it from their website i didn't want to be kind of uh, and their website says it and uh, there will only be any single in north india at least any single in the hindu household where you know even a scholar who keeps a copy of say ramayan for some study or something he'll say ki boss let's get the geeta press version english as well as hindi even mahabharat because it's cleaner it's well brought up it's a very high production quality there were the all the books are very high production even kalyan very high production quality kalyan being the magazine i'm uh, being the journal yeah magazine and the idea of uh, also gifting religious texts if you go to city like banaras or gorakhpur or you'll find that there is uh, or even delhi the delhi store in mm. uh, chandni chow in that old delhi If certain books if you call up and say do you have this no it's just run out of it you'll have to wait for a week and so it, it constantly sells and then in ramayan then they have this thing called what they call gutka which is basically smaller miniature version of ramayan you are on uh, road you can't carry the fat volume so you can read it that itself sells in lakhs and lakhs and and this figures also don't forget it would be what they um, export hmm and huge diaspora population relies on they're the big clientele in this uh, diaspora population because they were the first ones to even think of i will not say first one but the early ones mm. uh, who 1934 started a english journal called kalyan kalpataru because they said well we have to do something about them and in fact in your book you've got accounts of various people both indians yeah, and non indians writing from yeah, abroad yeah non indians and, and and they were trying to track people who could write even mm. uh, non hindus great scholars yeah. of hinduism jainism they were trying to get them to write to give it that uh, kind of very eclectic feel about it Let, let's kind of uh, go back to uh, the starting of it 
um let's talk about sort of the impetus behind the geeta press to talk it uh, to start off and uh, in your book you mentioned that there are sort of uh, three factors and let's kind of take them one by one and the first yeah. factor that you mention is the consolidation of uh, hindi uh, tell me a little bit about i mean all of us take hindi for granted like it's okay. been there forever yeah but uh, in a sense hindi was a political project of its own yeah it was because see um, this whole movement in which madan mohan malviya played a big role and 1900 which is called the mcdonald moment which is actually not my coin is alok rai's coin is which i find absolutely brilliant coin is uh, 1900 is when the petition finally leads to something to recognize know, hindi and to do a separate hindi as separate court language look mm. at that you know very smart move once you change it in court subsequently it has its impact you know it's uh, it has its ripple effect and a lot of things are happening simultaneously there is the soul hindi is now finally found some place at the cost of persian then um, what happens the print technology is just coming which is slowly settling down and marwari is the investors if you find in most in north india most of the publishing houses marwari is were investing and for philanthropic reasons too and then hindi is coming so first quarter of the 20th century is kind of a golden phase of uh, this publishing and hindi journals are coming one after the other one after the other english journals are also coming like first you have this great modern review coming from calcutta yeah, raman chatterjee. chatterjee but raman chatterjee was was a completely different sort of person he was also paying for bisal bharat Yeah, so in fact, Calcutta became a big center of Hindi publishing. So you had Saraswati coming from uh, Calcutta, you had Vishal Bharat, which continued till seventies actually. And in those days, in nineteen thirties, late thirties, he was incurring a loss of seventy thousand rupees, but he was still publishing it. So what I'm trying to say is that it was a golden phase of. Now, in that, all the journals which were coming were very general in nature, mostly literary. say um, saraswati or bisal bharat it will have bit of politics bit of literature bit of poetry you know the usual some international news but very well brought out geeta press in a way is the first one which is exclusively devoted to religion there were few other attempts made uh and it came also because you know marwari is there has been a churning happening within the marwari world because there was a section which was not kind of happy with the what the new found wealth was doing to the community as it is as goenka at one point says we are being equated with jews and you know we have this thing of us you know we taking money send you know lending on high rate of interest yes, which they all goenka which they all goenka and so there was this churning happening within and there was this and marwaris were known for the ostentatious display of wealth in the marriages in various other things so there was this two stream like jamna lal bajaj you had gd birla who were the, the moderate ones to deal with there were two ways like jamna lal bajaj and also just stop doing this become gandhian there's this other world of jadal goenka hanuman prasad podar and also the answer lies in going back to our roots and basically celebrating the sanatan dharm and that you know sanatan this is what we had a great past which was interrupted by muslim rule and now british rule and so we have to go back to in that period when we were doing extremely well in everything you know science literature and that's this whole thing kalyan finds a place so one motive was of course that introspection for the community but there was a larger good also involved that you know the country so go back to its ancient roots and that's when we were kind of doing very well no and i find it interesting that you know in a sense uh, the, the political core of both the rise of hindi and the establishment of the geeta press and kalyan seems to be the same which is yeah, harking back to a mythical yeah. past True. and leaving aside hindustani which is this yeah. conglomeration yeah, of yeah, urdu yeah. and persian yeah, 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 and whatever yeah, yeah. and creating hindi for the hindus you know and and really like you point out in 1877 bhartendu harish chandra gave yeah. this uh, speech called 
kinni ki unnati par vyakhya hai and from yeah, there of course ida is young yeah, yeah, but very it, young yeah. it kind of becomes a political movement and it totally makes sense that then the journal which is set up really to take that politics forward beyond just the religious aspect of it yeah. is in hindi and it all kind of seems to come together i also found your whole account of the churn in the marwari community a uh, very interesting for example i'll quote again from your book with marwari quote with marwari domination of the growth of indian capitalism in the late 19th and early 20th century two crucial but contradictory things happened stop quote and one is because they are the trading class and they're looking for profit and all yeah. that they become the butt of jokes like the jews did yeah. elsewhere uh, and and the second you point out is uh, you quote a historian who talks about the semi involuntary <laughs> upward mobility yeah i Just know this uh, f- fascinating in, in which vaishyas become the new kshatriyas yeah. so in fact you know because it was a money cloud of money you find that marwadis if you follow sanatan dharma for for a second for argument sake not that you one believes in it is that marwadis had no business to be wearing sacred thread right but because of the money you find that their entire ritual got brahmanized then you find the cre uh, the temples the schools the hospitals uh, the, you know sarais inns whatever they were making everywhere started bearing plaque of wealthy marwari who helped in building it or repairing it it's not a phenomenon you will not find it a single plaque as one of my historian friends says pre 20th century period marwaris were still coming up it's only after around the first quarter of 20th century that they had to establish themselves to deal with this infamy that they were being equated with jews their you know the money making thing was becoming bit of a problem for the, the community and there was a churning within also there was this whole thought process that we should do something in fact there is a historian uh, he is not a historian he is kind of a chronicler among marwaris called jamini barwa uh, who who did a completely i wish someone could have just put it together in a very different way he did a book called mai apni marwadi jati se pyar karta hu and he brings up i had to kind of really work hard to get that all those six volumes but he just puts together every single act of philanthropy that marwari's did till the period that he did book and across india so this was very very important to marwari's for so that whole getting this whole brahmanical ritual in the marriages also like a lot of my marwari friends have told me that a lot of rituals are completely brahmanical which was not happening say back home in rajasthan or anything so that that period becomes very crucial a lot of things are happening in the marwari world social business you, you know in their business life in the social life So in fact in your book you talk about the philanthropy and then you say quote through such initiatives marwaris replace the aristocracy and wealthy landlords as religious patrons yeah. and change the kshatriya brahman interface of hindu society to a vaishya brahman interface that eventually resulted in the marwariization of hinduism stop quote and it seems to me that what was really happening here was a marriage of convenience where the brahmans need the patronage of the marwaris True. and the marwaris are buying respectability yeah, through with the alliance absolutely through yeah, yeah and it, it, was, it was mutual it was, they were trying to help each other yeah. and uh, and chatriyas never had that kind of uh, you know they didn't have they could fight your war they could fight your battle but that's it and in this age those uh, yeah, uh, yeah you know rajput valor yeah, is pointless no, yeah. uh, and it's interesting how the proximate impetus for the geeta press actually comes from a sort of an argument within the marwari community where you talk about how in the oppressive delhi heat of march april 1926 yeah, yeah. there's a eighth annual conference of the all india marwari agarwal mahasabha and there there's an argument between gd bidla and atmaram khimka yeah, yeah. and atmaram khimka is talking about sanatan dharma yeah, and this is the direction and, we should yeah. go in and gd bidla is saying look this no. is not the platform for that yeah. if you want why don't you do a journal yeah. and that's how this journal comes about and then they have a train journey rohtak and they yeah. and all that happens yeah. yeah and so hey, it's actually fascinating you come to and and look at this larger network of marwari is also how they're helping out see the idea takes place somewhere in you know what is haryana and bajaj uh, press the family in bombay 
which are like the big publishers, they still apparently own the big mill land, money, the press land, because what they had from those days, they had a paper also, Bankatesh Samachar or something. And they were big publishers in those days. And he agrees to just do it for a year. Just, just take my press, do it. I think almost 14 months he did it. And meanwhile, Goenka is in Calcutta. Uh, Goenka is in Calcutta. Uh, Anuman Prasad Podar. Podar is the one who, then he moves to, after they went and moves to Gorakhpur, he moves to Gorakhpur. Yeah. Yeah. These are two of the impetuses which kind of, two of the uh, stimuli which made the Gita Press happen. One, the growth of Hindi as a political movement and then within the culture as a language that people speak and write in. And of course, this Marwari movement where they are getting more integrated into that uh, mainstream of Hinduism with, uh, mm-hmm. with the so-called, with their uh, putative alliance with the Brahmins. The, the third element that you point out is that the 1920s are a hotbed of political communalism. Yeah. Like you write about how there were 91 Hindu-Muslim riots in United Provinces between 1923 and 1927. And it's a memorable time because Savarkar's Hindutva comes yeah. out in 1923. The RSS is founded in 1925. Yeah. Um, and also, which is, you know, the Hindu Mahasabha is a very powerful party at this time, much more so than, than yeah, yeah. Uh, it is today. And also within the Congress, there is a very strong stream of Hindu traditionalists yeah, like yeah. Madan Mohan Malviya. And, so and who was also a member of uh, Hindu Mahasabha, you are a member yeah. of uh, Congress. Also. Founded the Banaras yeah. University. Just lay out that political landscape for me of the time and, and where sort of Hindu nationalism fits in. See, they, uh, I think till late 19, uh, I think somewhere till 1930s, uh, meeting of Gorakshni Sabha and Congress, Hindu Mahasabha and all the members, you could be a member of both. So Congress, when it now regrets and says, doesn't actually look back at its past, it's basically a very dominant class within the Congress. Nehru and Gandhi's they managed to battle this group, this dominant class within the party, but they were always there. You know, you have Malviya, you had Gosed Govindas, you had Govind Ballopant, much later, Said Govindas. So, you know, there's this whole stream of people who were very aligned to the Hindu cause. Uh, but they also knew Congress was the party which had a future. And in fact, I, I was fascinated by one of the nuggets in your book that uh, back in 1891, a Gaurakshini Sabha meeting took place during the Nagpur session of Congress. Ah, yeah, it, it was seen. Um, in fact, if you look at the records, I remember this one, uh, which leader it says he came out and this person who's reporting is saying he came out after giving a fiery speech in the Congress session and walked straight into the Gorakshni Sabha. What do you expect? So now when today Congress uh, says what it does, you know, they don't, they don't know about their own past. At least some of them don't. Even now, in fact, the problem of Congress is even now you have that element which exists. You know, this whole conundrum about whether to go to temple or not to go to temple. Rahul Gandhi is a Janudhari Hindu or not. Come on. So this is, this emanates from the past that they have, you know. And one and should name names in the party, in the Congress, but we know who are these leaders who are constantly pushing. So, but in fact, someone should ask Rahul Gandhi, the whole decision to be a Jano or this temple hopping, uh, was it something which he approved of or was someone telling him to do it? But, but I guess the, the, the thing with, for example, the so-called soft Hindutva of the Congress today is that a lot of it seems to be merely posturing. While back in the day, a yes. lot of the big leaders of the Hindu national yeah, because movement, they, they were very important leaders. Just see the battle that Nehru had to wage uh, with Purushottam Das Tandon on cow. Hmm. Imagine he says, I'll resign. He, and only someone like Nehru who had to really believe in what he did. And, and another, fight. another battle, in fact, which Nehru lost is when uh, uh, the idol of Lord Ram appears magically yeah. in uh, this thing. And Gobind Vallabhpant is then CM of UP. Lal Bahadur Shastri is Home Minister yeah. of UP. And he tells him, get the idol removed. And they ignore they, him. They ignore. Look at Rajasar Dayal's account when he says that nobody would listen to him. He was Home yeah. Secretary. And even in case of Podar, Podar uh, is among thousands of people. Nobody is saying whether they were directly involved or not. But yes, he was also who was suspected to have some, some role in Gandhi's assassination. How on earth someone who was arrested even for a few days in 48, in 51, will you recommend him for Bharat Ratna? Or which is what the then uh, which, uh, which uh, Govind Ballopant did. It's unimaginable. 
But how could you even suggest and you are saying you tear off this later? Well, that anyway was a tradition. Those everyone used to say, tell everyone, tear off the later. <laughs> and none of none of them did, you know. And now we come to the hero of the story, Hanuman Prasad Poddar, who is, of course, a cultural giant, which is yeah. why I think uh, Gobind Vallabhpant would have wanted to give him the Bharat Ratna. But he's also somewhat like Gandhi, a figure with many internal contradictions. Yeah, yeah. He is at one level is a fascinating man. You really want to. He never went to university. He never went to. I mean, if you read his English, you is impeccable. You see his range of readings; it's impeccable. He was a fascinating editor. He was an editor who could uh, go out of the way to. If you see his letters to some of these contributors, someone teaching in Hunter College in New York, his writing and he's not. He's just he's relentless. That you have to write. and his whole knowledge about who's working on what all over the world is fascinating even the new age sadhus who are coming up in a big way in germany who are teaching yoga he's aware of all of them he is uh, the way he gets after sampurnanand he says you have to i'll keep the issue on hold but you have to write and he lets him write and when sampurnanand as a chief minister Uh, write something which is not to his liking. He says, "Well, we'll publish it once, but we won't want any further debate on it." And he makes it very clear. So, if you, from his point of view, he was a, he was editor of more than forty years, forty six years, forty six years. It's not a man. and and in mind you, in between, many times he'll throw tantrums, he'll leave, he'll go away, but they'll never let him go away. He became. Did he larger than life? And on top of that, he had this whole spiritual aspect to him that he had visions of God and this and that. Yeah, which was very interesting. I mean, there was this whole origin myth about how he was born. Yeah, and everything. <laughs> so he was created. So you know, they they address him in a certain way in Gorakhpur. So he's seen as an incarnation of God. I know people who I know one lady who's like now now ninety plus. Coming from a very big industrialist family in Delhi, who just couldn't believe, who thought that I was doing a great work of God by writing on Gita Press, and uh, the kind of things that he had to say about uh, Podar, because Podar people saw those who believed in him saw him no less than. As incarnation of God. In fact, uh, you uh, quote Teji Bachchan. Uh, yeah, Teji Bachchan. Hey, imagine one of the birthday. I think seventh birthday of Ajita Bachchan. He's brought all the way to Gorakhpur. His you know, and then he did the Avdi Gita only at the instance of Radha Baba, who was like his guru and later. Yeah, so this was. Sure, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, just to quote like two. Different, very different aspects of Pudar, and, and both unrelated to sort of his professional work, but personal aspects which I found fascinating. And the first one is, of course, this kooky religious aspect. And you write, "Quote: Pudar would have more visions of God in the next few years." In 1936, he claimed to have been met in Gita Vatika, which was where he lived, hmm. by celestials, a sage Narada and Angiras. The sage who received the Atharva Veda. Hmm. Pudar claimed that they explained to him concepts which are not part of the Shastras. Stop quote, and and another aspect of it, which is a more introspective, self-critical aspect, which you write about later in the book. Uh, start quote, writing to an acquaintance, Podar said he was not the person he had been made out to be by others, and neither was Gita Press any more the yeah. ideal place to yeah. seek spiritual solace. And now it's Podar's words. Till a few years ago, this was a good place for those involved in spiritual exercise. This place is not fulfilling, as it is marked by demonic traits like self-promotion, jealousy, materialism. And he continues: There is no limit to my meanness and misdemeanors. Neither could I become a good person, nor could I help my associates uh, improve. Stop quote. Yeah. He he'll get into these long phases of self introspection where he will uh, he, all his replies to everyone would be of this nature you know I have failed I'm here and uh, mostly this will be when he'll be in Dalmia's factory in one place or he'll be in Ratanagar in Bikaner. This also in a way helped. Building what we call now, you know, Podar brand, you know, because people would know that there will be phases. No, now Bhaiji, as he was called, mm. Bhaiji has gone into sulk, or Bhaiji is in a different mode, so he has become inaccessible. And uh, but his when he is talking about the soul decline, the moral values in Gita Press, that is mostly because he could see what was happening around in his own family, what was happening with. Uh, Children, what not his children, but 
you know, associates, the children, they were going out eating. Then he has problems with people going watching cinema, people eating ice cream, people sharing, drinking from the same glass, which which they still continue to kind of propagate, you know. So, so uh, before we get on to sort of um, uh, the Gita press itself, how it grew, and one by one we'll tackle all the themes, uh, the broad themes that come up, there was an intriguing sidelight, which was... You write about this thing called the Rodda conspiracy. Yeah. Which this is well before the Gita. Yeah, yeah. Around when he was growing up in Calcutta. Yeah. When he was growing up yeah. and uh, some Marwaris were involved yeah, yeah, in this. Yeah, 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 he yeah. himself was yeah, arrested. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's very interesting that the Marwaris managed to hush up the matter and they get him out. And then they almost seem to take a decision as a community that we are not going to get into this kind of politics. No. We are going to do our dhandu. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and my question is that, is this also to some extent one of the many reasons that the Hindutva movement was never anti-colonial. Like later when the Gita press got into politics, it got into politics against fellow nationalists, uh, you know, against Nehru and against the Congress. Yes. But never it, against it, a yeah, British it was a big group Because see, they, for them, commerce was, uh, nothing came before commerce. It was for commerce that they left their family, wife, children, everyone behind in Rajasthan. This community was very focused and despite all the joke and whatever, you know, this larger thing which was said about Marwaris, that didn't deter them from the path. And here comes something which would have completely destroyed them. If you see the pages of Calcutta, Calcutta Samachar, which was uh, edited by Jhabar Mal Sarma, who was also Marwari, uh, they first tried to, because I was trying to track how what they're saying, because it was very important what... Calcutta Samachar says. So they're saying Kush Marwadiyon ki giraftari hui hai and then they give names. So G.D. Birla is also there, one of them, by the way. And, who had absconded. Uh, and who absconded and uh, and people say that he went to Uti and uh, fellow Marwadis who got arrested, they say that those days, apparently, more than a lakh was paid. Can you believe it? What the money would be? Crores today. Crores easily. Crores. Easily. Many, many crores. 30, 40 and uh, crores. that gentleman, that police officer, later on, which is even more interesting, I think uh, Medha's uh, biography of Birla says, uh, he, he or someone else wrote it, that that gentleman police officer later, after retirement from police, uh, was heading the London operations. <laughs> of the Birla. <laughs> of Birla's. Yeah. So, uh, so this immediately, so the first thing they did was, they just said that, okay, this and it was not even, uh, the, that tone was not defiant at all. That, you know, my community has done, my boys cannot do it, even if they do it, they were for the larger, no, 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 nothing. They said, basically they're saying these are misguided youth, mm. okay. And then they get certain people who were very close to the colonial rulers to come and speak to them. And be there, kind of negotiate on their behalf. And then Calcutta Samachar for the after that is constantly talking about how law abiding they are. They have nothing to do with all this. And as you said, just, just do your commerce. That they didn't want interrupted at all, which road arms. If you actually look at the original records, which is there in the sixth volume, which West Bengal government brought out. Uh, it's like they were been, they were really trying to get after them, but it got hushed. Only he and then the gentleman who later became a member of Raj Sabha, Prabhu Dayal Himmat Singh ka and few others got arrested. Their lives. So there was a rancor among some of these Marwadis that Birla got away. We we still had to. F- face punishment, spend time in jail. No, I mean, Himmat Singha was a post-independence minister. You know, minister. So he, he was, uh, he was, he became, himself. yeah, yeah. Himmat Singha became one of the top-notch lawyers in the country. Yeah. So, yes, that was, uh, basically keep away from all this, uh, from whatever is happening. And, and this is, uh, you, you know, also interesting because Podar, you know, before this, he got very influenced by uh, the extremists within the Congress party, yeah. as you point out, Bipin Chandrapal and so on. And he also simultaneously and later on in time and through the years, this became a love-hate relationship, but got extremely close to Gandhi. Yeah, got very, very, very often close to for Gandhi, the yeah. Gita Press. And, and, and we'll discuss that in, uh, as well in the second half is really that relationship is fascinating. But what seems to me is that after this uh, Roda thing happens and they are let off, uh, he pretty much decided that I'm going to stay away from politics and the Gita press is really a cultural thing. But at the same time, it's a political project which yeah, is, is a political project. happening under the surface. And, and which he makes. His very first editorial of Kalyan in 1926, it's a fascinating, which is a kind of a template 
from which Gita Press is not wavered at all, where he talks of everything, where he talks about what is happening all over the world, he's talking about what is Hindu-Muslim unity, he's talking about what we should do to... Mm, and mostly it, it doesn't become, it doesn't have anti-colonial uh, language. It's mostly about the community, it's mostly about the religion, and Muslims, of course. And when they, he says that, you know, we should learn from Muslims to be together and fight together. And then he says, uh, uses the word Sangabal, ki avisakta hai, which is unity of strength. strength. No, in, 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 in fact, at, a, at, at a different, point, uh, different points in time, he almost sort of cozies up to the British. For example, when George V dies in 1926, <laughs> uh, you know, again, quoting from your book, uh, his death in 1926 came at a time when Kalyan was still finding its feet. And for a journal that counted Hindu nationalism as a sine qua non of the freedom movement, paying tribute to King George V was possibly a calculated act to win the goodwill of the colonial yeah. government. Odar called George uh, V an ideal husband, father, son and friend and justified the gloom his death had brought to his subjects. Uh, family and friend. How would he know George Five? His <laughs> ideal father. <laughs> that that <laughs> was a yeah. That's <laughs> randomly, kuch bhi bol do. Kuch bhi bol do. Do whatever to please them. You yeah. Know? You know, and as the project gets underway, I mean, you write about how gradually the early issues of Kalyana sort of a testing ground for what become lead motifs and dominant themes later, like cow slaughter and gender and so on, which we'll discuss as we go along. But I was particularly struck by how, even though. Uh, the Gita Press and Kalyan was, you'd put it in the philanthropic box of the Marwaris, that they are not doing this for profit. This doesn't mean dhando. Nevertheless, you describe that the model of Hinduism they sell is almost a Baniya model in your yeah, words. And I'll yeah, see, the Baniya model, um, see, they had to make religion attractive. Hmm. One of the ways in which uh, which this started right in the beginning, and which in a way played a big role, and continues to, in fact, is that Selling you recite God's name for twenty fifty thousand times, or you write in a notebook and submit to us. They had the Ramayan Bank and all that, and then they had this Ram Nam Jab Bibhag, and they had a similar thing for something for Gita. So it immediately struck a chord among people, among the literate people, uh, that okay, just to I know people who in, even now are doing it, sending the notebooks full of Ram, 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 and they're sending it and they're saying, okay, we've written one lakh times or, or so it brought God and directly, you know, there's a direct interface with God. And then they said, then this Bhagwan Mahima Ankh they brought out of Kalyan, which is a fascinating issue where everyone is talking about bizarre things have happened because they believed in God and they recited the name of the God and they, so many times or they did this and it helped someone's daughter's marriage. Two days before marriage, someone, postman brings 20,000 rupees from somewhere. You know, all, all kinds of um, things. And it's almost happened. a transactional model of Hinduism. Yeah, right? it was a very you transactional. You jump a name enough uh -huh, times, uh -huh, you will uh -huh, get it. Bus, bus. You, you, you do it, you will get it. And they'll say, keep, therefore, the stress on whole rituals that you know, if you want a male child, you have to do this. <laughs> you know, if you want uh, to do this, you have to have fast in the first hour of uh, on certain day. And so, and you find that this is, even now Kalyan has a full page which says ki in the coming month, the next month, what will be the celestial positions of, and what can you do when, which is, and, and there are every day some Purnima or some Ekadsi or some Dwadsi, if you go by it. And people are following, if I have seen women in Gorakhpur who are um, kind of um, doing it all the time, and even outside Gorakhpur, you know, you know women who are doing it. In fact, I was also, uh, you know, going to discuss the sort of um, uh, the strategic genius of Podar and the various things they did about outreach, which include the Gita Sabhas, Ramayana Sabhas, mm. Gita tests for children where yeah. they would give prizes and medals yeah, yeah. for kids and the Gita Society. And, and what you're talking about, this transactional model and these yeah. rituals that you perform. Again, I'll quote from your book. 
because I, I just found this an incredibly fascinating and jaw dropping quote. Uh, stop quote. Four kinds of membership were on offer for the Gita department. The first included those who read the entire Gita, 18 chapters, once every day, 365 times in a year. The second type of members could finish all the chapters over two days and the complete text 180 times in a year. The third category of members re- uh, read, uh, read six chapters in a day, thus reading the Gita 120 times in a year. The last category of members could reach as much of the Gita as they wish daily as long as they completed at least 42 readings in a year. Stop quote. Yeah, and it's fascinating. You don't need to live, live a virtuous life. You don't need to yeah, just just nothing. just read it, and your job is done. You know, we'll we'll now take a quick break, and we'll come back after the commercial break to get really into the meat of what uh, the Gita Press was all about and uh, what the Sanatan Dharm Hindu movement was attempting to do. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Instagram was a big week for us this week. We crossed 10,000 followers. Also, you should check out the kind of stuff that we do over there. Get a look into the studio. And, you know, I mean, like, see some of the quotes and stuff like that that come out and uh, audiograms and, you know, all that other kind of good stuff. So, you know, let me tell you about two new shows that are coming up, right? So, the first one let me talk to you about is GBCD. This show is hosted by Farhad and Sunetru. They share the ABCDs of their queer lives and dig into the memories and experiences. Tune in for a new episode every week on Tuesdays. Another show we're really excited to bring you is called Feeding 10 Billion. This show is hosted by Good Food Institute's Varun Deshpande and Ramya Ramamurthy. They talk to experts in the food industry about rethinking protein and reimagining food systems in India. New episodes out every Tuesday for this show as well. Also, Simplify is completing 150 episodes. My God, I can't believe that we're already there. They need your help to celebrate this milestone. Send us theories, concepts, or questions that you have using the hashtag Simplified150 on Twitter or send us a DM on Instagram and Chuck Narina Shrike will answer your questions on episode 150. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by Rajiv Lakshman of Raghu Rajiv from Rodi's fame. He shares childhood stories of growing up with a twin brother, his memories of Cyrus at MTV, and his new show, Skulls and Roses. The Ganatantra podcast is back from a hiatus with a warm-up episode. Sadhu and Alok discuss themes that you can look forward to in Season 2. On What a Player, Akash, Mikhail and Siddharth talk about the Bangladesh-Zimbabwe Tri-Series. Monty Panesar is the next mayor of London, the physical requirements for playing chess and a lot more. On Tech Careers in the News, Shiladiti is joined by Kaushik Vijay Raghavan and Aditi Kulkarni to talk about intelligent automation and its impact on the real world. On Agla Station Adulthood, Ritasha and Ayushi dive into romantic relationships and the complexities that they entail. On Keeping It Queer, Farhad and Naveen talk to performance artist Swapnil Alize about accepting her identity, her love for dance and her group Color Positive. On our Kannada podcast, Salle Harate, Narahari KS joins Ganesh and Pawan to share an overview of public relations in India and how it is involved. And with that, let's get you on with your show. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Akshay Mukul, writer of the brilliant book, The Gita Press and the Making of Hindu India. Let's kind of go through the different sort of dominant themes that the Gita Press took up. Some of them resonate to this day. And, and one of them is the cow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and people today seem to think that this is a recent thing. And of course, to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, because, um, for example, cow slaughter would mainly have Muslims and Dalits uh, involved in it. The whole movement almost seems as a proxy to uh, just attack those guys. But it goes a lot deeper than that, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. In fact, uh, cow and women have been, uh, I don't think there's been a single issue of Kalyan where these two virtue of cow and the need to keep the sanctity or of Hindu women is not discussed in one way or the other. In fact, there's a sentence uh, that I remember from your book where you write about how where you quote someone saying wars have been fought over cows and women. Yeah, wars have been uh, and and cow was because uh, cow was a rallying point for them. Cow they realized uh, would help them tide over the deep caste divisions which the Hindus had. It would help them talk of, not talk of other things. And mind you, when this uh, Gorakshni Sabha started and the violence started in the name of cow, Marwaris were bankrolling, but who were the foot soldiers? Foot soldiers were people like, the communities like Yadavs and Kurmis. In fact, if you see the, in place like Bihar, some of the riots uh, that took place around that period, most of the perpetrators, Hindu perpetrators were the Yadavs. So it created a kind of um, so and cow became a very easy symbol for them and um, 
only when you find only in the 90s or late 80s early 90s after the mandal happened that we find for some time that cow although the cow movement has been constant has been going on but we find that um, the ram temple or something came as a rallying point but otherwise cow has been constant in fact when 2014 uh, these people came to power kalyan talked in detail about and then maharashtra government banned it one of the earlier states in 2014 to do it they were very happy they said now it should be done across india it should be banned across india and uh, there's this whole thing why only few states are doing it so it was um, since 1951 election also every election when they tell readers who to vote uh, they don't mention a party they only say that just vote for a party which will do these you know one two three things so uh, this has been a very very cow has been the most important um, symbol or the most sacred of things are on which they have kind of uh, worked and and geeta press has a big role to play also because the cross linkages that geeta press created among other groups there were a lot of other groups exclusively working for cow for cow protection and other things and that famous in the 60s the cow protection movement which led to attack on parliament atlas podar was at the helm of it he was a treasurer for a long time and uh, geeta kalyan was kind of if you used to see kalyan of that time it was uh, spewing venom and uh, as you pointed out they had two special issues on cow one was a gao ank uh, which was gao ank and then later gao on seva gao seva ank which was which happened in the uh, much later it was kind of and i was trying to figure out why is a cow sacred to hinduism and you quote peter vandermeer yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. in your book where uh, again i'll quote from your book hmm. uh, peter vand a uh, quote peter vandermeer asks a question why would people want to die and kill for the protection of cow yeah. he looks at the centrality of the cow at four levels one in brahmanical rituals a cow is akin to mother or symbol of the earth the narisha uh, goddess who fulfills every wish kamdhenu symbol of wealth and good fortune lakshmi who is integral to ritual blah 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 to sacredness is also attached to cow products like milk dung and urine consumption of milk butter and ghee is believed to make a person satvik and a mixture of five cow products milk curd butter urine and dung is used to prepare the panch gavya that is used to purify a polluted person parenthesis it was offered as a solution for hindu women who had lost their modesty during the communal riots at the time of partition and we we'll stop parenthesis and we'll come back to it at this when we talk about gender three the symbol of cow is a wish fulfilling mother of krishna is celebrated in the bhakti cult and finally gau mata was same symbolic of both family and community protecting the cow meant reiterating the patriarchal authority like the kingdom of rama which is ram rajya they are ideal hindu state stop quote and it's interesting that once we gain independence and india sort of goes in a different direction you also talk about how cow protection arguments begin to be framed in secular terms such yeah. as you know where you for example um, how they talk about the cows high economic utility yeah, they, they talk did. about the relationship between the quality of cattle and general prosperity yeah. um, you talk about how national pride is associated with economic prosperity which is brought about by cows and also about how the cow can cement harmonious relationships between hindus and muslims yeah. see uh, some of these people had they been alive and seen what was happening now what is happening now in the name of cow i'm sure they wouldn't have approved of it because whatever they're doing they were, they were very clear that you know the cow was alive that you, how do you get rid of the cow which is old ailing and died on its own okay nobody even if you're not selling it to a slaughterhouse everyone knew what was happening to cow but they knew the skin was being used the body parts so whatever you know various ways it's were being used and they were aware of the economic aspect of the whole thing even rajendra prasad when he's writing in goang he's talking about it and he's saying that let them die on their own and don't give to slaughter house they and they constantly they'll invoke example of saudi arabia or all one of these countries and they'll say oh cows are not slaughtered even there then the example of humayun or babar one of this now what is happening i don't think the, the, this whole killing i don't know whether they were approving uh, or maybe if had uh, this kind of i had you know the kind of government we have now the full hindu government been in par maybe it would have happened one doesn't know but that generation was aware of that there has to be some you know 
resolution to this whole cow thing. I cow is giving me milk, helping me in various ways. At the end of it, what to do with cow? Old ailing cow, can a farmer afford five old ailing cow and have new ones also? Impossible. So there was a way and they were aware of it, what was happening. Otherwise, how were slaughterhouses working and how were Hindus running the slaughterhouses? And in some of these areas where this movement was very, very strong, Western UP and other places, and in Maharashtra, for instance, although these Podar and all worked very uh, kind of actively to you know, close many slaughterhouses in Bombay, they, were, they had this uh, huge slaughterhouse which got closed in those days, I think in the 50s uh, in Bengal. Uh, Bengal, they got certain slaughterhouses closed. But they had some model that, you know, you do, you have a pasture land, you do this. At least they were, that's what they talk. Since they were never in power in those days, one doesn't know how it would have kind of panned out. But I don't know whether they have approved of what is happening now. No, and some of the sort of narratives that came up around the cow seem quite goofy. For example, you co- quote someone called Prabhupada Brahmacharya, yeah, yeah, yeah. who prescribed a tenfold path for Hindus and Hindutva to survive. And quoting you, quote, he asked Hindus to keep cows at home, even if this meant they had to have fewer motor vehicles. Yeah. Stop quoting, try telling yeah. a modern talk to that. But, 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 but the, funniest, the, the funniest thing that I found was a Vanaspati controversy. Yeah, Vanaspati. <laughs> Tell me a bit about that. See, Vanaspati... This is a vegetable oil which yeah, sort yeah, of replaced ghee yeah, as yeah, a cooking yeah, yeah, medium. Which, yeah. So, there was this, um, you know, there's this famous Jain Banaspati case which happened sometime in the 80s. This news, I think, broken by a journalist, I think Manoj Mitta played a big role in it. Where this whole beef tallow which was being used and some of the Marwadis were involved. This, this class, this community was involved. And... Uh, when the time when they're getting very involved with it, uh, you find that Gita Pare suddenly turns very business, it's like a business weekly, monthly, where they're even listing out early days, they were talking of making this distinction between the companies which use beef tallow and not beef tallow. This is what the controversy that I'm talking about happened much later. And they listed out the companies uh, which were mostly the Marwadi owned companies, which were. In fact, the first one was uh, Gita Press. Gita Press. Uh, Later company. on, they had to leave uh, this business. They abandoned this business because something happened, something very controversial, which they will not talk about. So when it came to, you know, their business, they used Gita Press to the hilt, especially in when in a crisis like uh, this uh, Banaspati ghee controversy. So it was uh, used by them. In fact, and then they, what they did also on Banaspati whole controversy, they got more and more people to write on it, you know. And when it suited, they used Gandhi, you know. So, in fact, there's a, again a quote from a book where uh, Gandhi summarizes an article by Datar Singh, who was yeah, America well, Gandhi's America's grandfather. grandfather yeah. yeah, and he was also a prominent. Uh, he was a cow consultant for the government or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, Quoting again from your book, quote, Gandhi summarized Singh's article for wider dissemination. Vanaspati, he said, is a poor substitute for ghee. But due to the great margin of profit in this industry, its production has developed from 26,000 tons per annum in 1937 to 105,000 tons in 1943. Such rapid growth of the Vanaspati industry, Gandhi feared, will not only adversely affect the welfare of the cultivators, but ha- will have a deleterious effect on the cattle industry upon which the prosperity of the whole nation directly depends on yeah. quote and it almost sounds like Basia's candle makers petition that you know block out this <laughs> brother yeah. yeah yeah and another interesting thing that I didn't know about though I consider myself fairly well informed on Indian politics was the whole uh, sort of the cow slaughter agitations of the 60s which which came to a head as you point out on 7th November um, 1966 where Delhi witnessed a surge of people estimated between 125,000 and 700,000. Yeah. And among the people who addressed the crowd in front of parliament were people like Golwalkar, Ka- Karpatri Maharaj, Prabhudad Brahmachari, Seth Govindas of the Congress, Atal Bihari Vajpayee yeah. and Hanuman Prasad Podar. Yeah. Hanuman Prasad Podar was actually the treasurer of that. Uh, Maha- that Goraksha Mahabhyan Samiti. Mm. He was a very, very important person, in fact. And I also mentioned somewhere, I think here only when I'm talking about cow, how RSS Kader 
he is thanking Goldwalker, saying yeah. that how oh, your Kada helped our people train and all that because of this whole violence which happened and the way they attacked the city. That's basically this uh, Lutian's Delhi got really attacked. Menand, not Kamrad's house got vandalized. A lot of some of his stuff got beaten up. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, no, and and they would always play the victim. So even every time there was yeah, a riot, they, they would be like, "Oh, yeah, yeah. the Muslims started it." We yeah, yeah. The then even in this, they played victim. But for a change to, uh, with Indira Gandhi, they were like, for some time, they were really they didn't know that this is the kind of actions he's going to take. Mm. She didn't know that a lot of people who were arrested and in Tihar jail will get beaten up. Either police did it or fellow prisoners were asked to beat them, which is a normal practice in jails, you know, in Indian jails. That kind of really rattled them. They never thought that this will go on for so long. So you find it's almost what they were doing during the national movement or later during emergency, very apologetic tone. Uh, they're almost writing to Indira Gandhi saying that addressing her sister that no we didn't do this we got you got it wrong and the movement completely disappears and because government created its own kind of uh, committee and said we are doing this and they got somehow trapped into this so the movement more or less dies in the the aftermath of that much later again and therefore you find there is a period of lull on cow movement although these groups were constantly working and if you go to places like Rishikesh, Brindavan and Mathura, Banaras you find these groups existed but they lost that uh, time although Gita Press continued to talk about it Gita Press in his journal will talk and all that so you you know so just kind of thinking aloud that like you said the in politics the cow issue waxed and waned and you know now it's back of course uh, but Gita Press kept talking about it throughout was it something like did they genuinely expect cow slaughter to at some point in time be banned across the country or was it more of a rhetorical tool to mobilize Hindus both, because they they could also see that even post uh, immediately after independence, you see what what was happening in UP. UP had agreed, uh, so th- they could see even the ambivalence of the Congress government. So the Congress leaders on cows, although how else was Govindas addressing? Uh, was Congress leader? He never left Congress until uh, he was. He was, uh, I think, till before that he was member of CWC. Uh, if you uh, this one uh, who Lal Bahadur Shastri Lal Bahadur Shastri uh, well Lal Bahadur Shastri didn't come out in the open but uh, the Gulzari Lal Gulzari Lal Nanda quit and uh, came in support of the movement so Congress's ambivalence um, they figured out and it's also you know the cultural thing among Hindus so very few people could make that distinction on cow which Nehru's western upbringing Nehru's Refined man, um, refined thinking. He could he could make that distinction that don't do this. You will destroy our economy. And he just kept that economy, nothing else. In fact, people who talked about the cow, he called them economically illiterate. Yeah, well, he was absolutely right. He, he made some big mistakes himself, yeah. but he, he was, was right about this. When you read that uh, speech he gave in Parliament when the private member bill is moved and he appears in that day in Parliament, uh, and he says, "What are you two people doing?" And so he could understand he and he never got into this religion mumbo jumbo, religious mumbo jumbo. He said, let's skip it to economics. If you don't guys don't understand you people talk of rural economy. Do you realize what this what will do to our rural economy? But then so partly it was that uh, the, the right wing figured out that cow is something on which very few parties will have the guts to come and Nehru is gone. Nehru is dead and gone and so Congress after Nehru, if you see, it's been a kind of uh, its ambivalence continues till now on certain issues on cow or bait anything. Even in Parliament, just to see on certain bills, Congress could have easily come out and kind of opposed it. But I mean, they they, they they run states where there are cow protection cells in the yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, look, uh, what's um, uh, happening in Madhya Pradesh or even in Rajasthan instances have happened. So, Congress has always been a lesser evil in these matters and various other things, of course, are the bigger evils. So, and of course, it becomes a very easy rallying. It helps you paper over the large differences within the Hindu society of caste and everything. Cow is something on which 
uh, very few people will, you, you know, then you only talk of cow for Hindus. You are not talking of uh, other things. Like temple entry movement, every time you talk, it reveals the great divide, uh, divide uh, in the Hindi uh, among Hindus. Cow doesn't. Let's talk about caste uh, since you brought it up. And, and you know, very early on, Podar sort of, uh, you know, he supports Varnashram. And, okay, so before we get to caste, there's sort of a broader question that in terms of their beliefs and caste, in terms of their beliefs in gender, and in both cases, their beliefs basically boil down to uh, you should know your place. So within a caste system, this is a Varnashram, this is everybody's place. Uh, if you're a woman, this is your place. And, and we'll discuss that in detail at some yeah. point. And it all goes back to the whole karma thing that you are where you are because of the misdeeds of your past birth. Absolutely. And th- therefore, there's no need to change it. This is your karma playing this itself karma. out. Do something well in this life and next and life, maybe you will be born. Maybe. Upper past with, with, yeah. In the long run, we're all being born. Run. Yeah. <laughs> As Keynes would have yeah, said if he was exactly. a Hindu. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. So, this is... Uh, so, caste was very, very crucial to them. In fact, therefore, you find right from the beginning, even early days in the first few issues of Kalyan also, they're talking of basically this Chaturvarna system, the Varnashram, and this is what it is. And, uh, but only after 1932, once the Pune Pact gets signed, is when they're really agitated. And the first rupture in relations with Gandhi takes place. That, how could you? And then he's kind of showing him his old articles, or citing old articles of Gandhi to Gandhi and saying that, look what you wrote. But Gandhi's, the good thing about Gandhi was he was constantly evolving, admitting his mistakes. He's saying, yes, I did. So what? I moved on. This is what I think, which they could never kind of come to terms with. And after that, the stress on caste becomes more pronounced in Kalyan and other places and they're constantly and they go to the extent of saying that you know just because you carry you know the this whole scavengers because uh, because of what you do you have germs in your body imagine saying this and getting away with it they're writing it and getting away with it and the kind of terms they use for Ambedkar and uh, because they were very worried, they were very angry about what he was doing with Hindu court bill, Ambedkar. And on top of that, second, he had married a Brahmin woman. That kind of got their court. In your book, you've spoken about how they always called him Hinvarna. Hinvarna. Lower caste. Ha, lower so, caste. Imagine addressing Hinvarna, Dr. Ambedkar. They were very, very angry with Ambedkar. In fact, see, Nehru, they could still think he are, uh, he's one among us who's gone, you know, off his off track. But this man? Yeah. Like and, and in a similar sense, something that reminded me of what even Modi does today is that when it comes to Muslims, they'll refer to Mia Jinnah huh. and Mia Liyakar. Mia Liyakar. And you have Modi doing his Mia Musharraf um, Mia of, uh, a decade ago. Yeah. And so, so this is uh, uh, just showing them their place and constantly talking about it. They were so worried when he was contesting from two constituencies in Bombay that what if he wins? And they could never forgive him for what he did to, because of the Hindu court bill. Even if he resigned, and Nehru was also not giving up on Hindu court bill, broke it, but got it passed. And these guys didn't know what to do with him. <laughs> so, we will come to the yeah. Hindu court bill later. I, I found, uh, you know, one of the letters from Poddar to Gandhi, you uh, sort of uh, reproduced, was very fascinating, where Poddar yeah. is writing to Gandhi, quote, These days, a big agitation by Dalits is going on in the country that has intensified due to your fast. At various places, people are dining with Dalits and they are being allowed inside temples. Outcome only God knows. Just like those believing in God and Shastras are accused of blind faith, I find that this movement has not only become a victim of blind faith, but also there is a lack of discernment. Even those in favor of dining with Dalits agree, though I do not equate dining with them as a mark of equality, that they cannot be considered pure unless they have a pure bath, wear fresh clothes, give up alcohol and meat and at least stop feasting on dead cattle. Only then co-dining makes sense. But your common dining in temple entry movement is not even checking if they fulfill those norms. And so on he goes of uh, 
ranting on and on and in the end he says even pandavas and kauravas used to dine together but it led to a big battle yeah uh, <laughs> and it seems as if you know on some of these issues like dalits and muslims and uh, cows uh, he almost gets unhinged unhinged uh, and then you realize that okay wasn't this journal supposed to be bhakti gyan vairagya uh, journal which will talk about bhakti and knowledge and renunciation look at this man he's just and something would happen then the world, like one marriage gandhi had made this uh, made some announcement that he'll only attend marriages where at least one partner is uh, you know from dalit come is harijan and this comes to uh, podar's notice he says he says he is like almost abusive he said he has lost his mental balance but then at the same time it's very difficult to figure out this and around the same time you find there's a letter uh, which come to him from jamnalal bajaj saying that oh bapu wants you uh, to be part of some journal which was bring out on again on cows or something so he says bapu ke pyar se mahatma ka kya lena dena something he says he makes that distinction that you are mahatma for the world and you do all those things which i don't approve of, but you are my bapu mm-hmm. so at personal level yeah i relate to you I, okay fine but yeah 32 kind of uh, gave them this they just couldn't figure out what has happened to the world you know why people are going on and on talking about this that's very interesting i mean the whole this is almost i mean forgive me if that sounds kind of sacrilegious but this whole journey of gandhi on caste also is kind of funny where it seems to me that okay at one point he talks about varnashram and how the castes have their place and basically says the same kind of thing poddar would have utterly agreed with hmm. and then he goes to this other side where he says that no no we need to dine together and all of that hmm. but to me it seems like if you go by some of his actions he's still posturing a bit and ambedkar kind of sees through it and the ambedkar yeah, yeah, they, they, are, they never ambedkar see uh, even the pact was a bit of a compromise and ambedkar is always suspicious of him throughout it's not that the relationship uh, ever is very very you know the kind of relations that gandhi had with uh, nehru or something no he and they were all they, they inhabited different universes it was a very very momentary thing what happened in uh, pool yeah. pact and all that yeah, yeah. and and so gandhi was in a sense it almost feels like neither ghar ka na ghat ka that uh, <laughs> he's lost to geeta press and he's yeah, lost yeah. ambedkar and yeah, he's basically yeah. in all his posturing yeah, in the game yeah but then gandhi play. always had enough to move on yeah. he was yeah gandhi was gandhi didn't care much about these small things of what podar <laughs> thought or what uh, ambedkar was doing yeah and the most fascinating parts of your book are parts which actually deal with uh, gender and the remarkable thing is how you point out that even till today yeah. they have those same kind of yeah, yeah. incredibly uh, uh, regressive uh, views yeah. and i'm i'm just going to quote a bit yeah i mean i mean their fundamental um, uh, sort of belief is again quoting from your book in quote independence is not promised to women in the hindu social structure yeah. a woman has to live with a father till marriage with a husband as a married woman and after his demise she has to live either with a son or some other relative she cannot be independent at any cost and a little later while talking about menstruation Yeah. Uh, Bodhar writes I'll quote from your uh, book again presenting his skewed understanding of female sexuality Bodhar wrote that during her menstrual period a woman had an uncontrollable urge for sex yeah. and to channelize this vasana yeah. there is a system of uh, vasana and sexual urge there is a system of marrying girls by the time they attain puberty in the husband shelter a woman's sexual desire does not reach others and she is safe from getting polluted if she is not married her sexual desire degenerates into debauchery just the way it is happening in europe the core job of a woman was to serve the world how podar used two word two terms utpadan which means manufacturing or production and nirman which means construction or creation thus a woman's job was to procreate and nurture quality men stop going yeah. and uh, you know when i was uh, actually <laughs> uh, writing that period this part uh, my niece was my daughter was very small she was in i think she was still in class 7 or something so i made her read it i said what do you think of this i made them read that pamphlet Mm. As what do you think of it? I made my niece, who's elder and who's in going to engineering college, so I better read it. So, is this what you're writing? So they were not very sure what what I have to do with that. So I said, well, this is what it is, and it's still being sold. 
say istri dharm prashnotri i the last one when my hindi translation was being done and i lost my own copy i picked it up from railway i had gone to drop someone on the railway station i got it and just look at the circulation when it's something produced in 1926 getting sold in 2019 has a constituency has a readership selling someone, more than chetan bhagat selling more than chetan bhagat then what is happening someone somewhere is reading it and even 10% i don't know what percentage i have no figures but someone is getting influence too so what is happening when you see this strange kind of things happening outside the urban spaces you realize that people are getting influence what is being done to women in term in just controlling their sexuality basically control you know using whatever be the absurd logic yeah and basically the whole deal is that a woman's only job is to make her husband look good yeah. to the world and to serve so we'll him in the inner space yeah. in, internal uh, this, uh, the four walls of the house and just procreate that's yeah. it yeah. and you have no other job and 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 you know in this context one of the things i noticed in your book though you don't always call it out as such but it's is that what kalyan is also doing what padar is doing is a lot of what today we would call fake news they are just randomly and i and i found a few examples of these and like in one place you say uh, quote podar cited a labor mp speech in the british parliament in which he reportedly said 40% of girls under 20 got pregnant before marriage yeah. and among married women the first child was illegitimate in 25% of the cases yeah. which is complete <laughs> rubbish and and, and th- there was a similar thing from yeah, lahore about yeah, how yeah, all yeah, the girls over 12 were hostel. pregnant yeah 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 i know i know i know uh you know and one that is not and uh, okay but another one podar claimed without substantiation that sexually transmitted diseases were prevalent among 50% of students and another one which is not related to gender but i found it so funny was a quote one of gandhi's associates telling people in gujarat that cow fat was mixed in the manufacture of foreign cloth or a leaflet stating yeah. that a thousand pounds of colored manchester cloth consisted of 300 pounds of cow and big blood stop quote this is how they propagate it no no substantiation nobody will ask someone will print it so we are now worried of fake news from in social media which is still your print is still more or less still all right you know uh and then it was happening in print you know and it was everyone was doing the it the most popular heartland magazine yeah, yeah. reaching everyone yeah, yeah, reaching and you everyone. don't have any pratik sena or alt news no, to no, sort no, of no one, uh, no pratik sena nothing So and yeah. you randomly are saying labor MP. Who is this labor MP? Will, <laughs> then they will quote some study about something happened to a generation of women. Who? What study? Which study? They will never mention it. Yeah, and there's other stuff like, for example, at a later point, he's uh, uh, in the 1948 Nari Yang Podar sort of um, glorifies Sati. and uh, his narrative rests on his genuine scientific belief yeah. when you put uh, scientific in <laughs> quote marks of yeah. course that fire can emanate from yeah. a distraught yeah. widow's shoulder and heart so he's saying no one sets a woman on fire but if she is pativrata and a virtuous woman her sorrow for her husband will make her spontaneously combust uh, which she calls a uh, Uh, scientific and this stuff is just nuts and millions of people are reading it yeah yeah reading it mind you nari ank is still in circulation hmm. nari ank is very much it keeps getting reprinted and nari ank is one of these year end special the oh, yeah, 700 yeah, yeah, pages yeah, yeah. at the beginning of the year they have special which is like 1000 pages you you have all these yeah yeah i have all of these yeah yeah, yeah. i have kept all of it oh, i should have, have asked you to bring one <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah yeah i have all of nari ank hindu ank everything have all the issues and what is the noise to signal ratio like how much of this is is bullshit kind of fake news nonsense and how much is actually well reasoned uh, stuff see when it comes to women mm. i'll say 100% is bullshit mm, of course, course. Mm. uh on cow they were doing both the things mm. see go sevan comes at a time for instance when the movement is at its slowest step so it's talking it is very economic in nature this it's is 90s or something uh, this is 90s mm-hmm. 93 or something if mm-hmm. i'm getting mm-hmm. the year right so by then the movement was not there you know ram temple movement was at the center stage it had some things it has few articles by experts which is talking of how to make economic use of cow is fine you can even sense a change of narrative then it's not a strident they're trying to make it sound uh, they're trying to make, therefore they made the distinction of 
go ank which had already come and the main go seva ank mm. where was the, the, they were discussing economics of it and various other aspects otherwise see they will always throw this sastras or some sutras or some slokas or something which ordinary reader i don't know how many of them would understand i'm not saying because i myself never cross check when it came to this religious text so i am not in a position to comment on that but yes when you claim this scientific study on women or sati or uh, women burning on their own because of some combustion happening inside <laughs> it's like hey, what do you do to that you know you write you can read you just it freaks you out you know what do you do with this such thing you know yeah and and for example i mean a, a lot of their stands to do with gender are crazy like they were against birth control so again quoting from your book quote uh, podar saying encouraging artificial methods is like encouraging evil artificial methods of birth yeah. control yeah. it makes men and women frivolous yeah. artificial methods would result in impotence yeah. and decline in sperm count yeah. this remedy would prove to be worse than the disease uh, elsewhere he is ranting against cinema and he says quote first and foremost female actors should be thrown out completely they are the root cause of all evil yeah. second film should not consist of anything that perverts a mind yeah. there will be hangama at first but then people will get used to the changes stop quote and it's interesting that while all this is happening what podar has done and probably shows his genius as an editor and you alluded to it earlier is that he has an extremely wide cast of contributors yeah. to uh, uh you know it's not just a typical hindu nationalist in the hindu no no people. no you're very very smart that way you had you know you had people like radha krishna writing for mm. him some issues radha krishna was not writing on controversy he was a philosopher he kept to that he didn't get into areas which he was not gandhi wrote a lot uh, gandhi wrote a lot um nehru is the only one which even he got the hill, big hindi writers to write you know uh, premchand to nirala to everyone and they'll privately say what to do uh, we don't know anything but because of his or uh, in you know, or uh, his charm whatever it is even premchand wrote nirala wrote i think among that generation of hindi writers mathli saran gupt uh, was the only one who wrote enthusiastically or hariyad may be but others were not very keen someone like nirala who was too irreverent to get into this but then well and it's almost like popodar has like strategically decided that okay what do i do to make it as respectable yeah, yeah. this way yeah, as yeah. possible one get all the politicians two get all the hindi literates yeah. three get people from other religions yeah, right yeah. other religions also and four get a uh, people from abroad, abroad. so he, it gained them a lot of respect because of that you know mm. and and it helped build a huge network and let, let's move on now to the next theme and this is not really a theme as just an underlying backdrop to all of this which is their attitudes towards muslims i mean even if they had a few muslim writers as there there's a lot of this constant baiting when jinna is mentioned is mia jinna when yeah, yeah. leela is mentioned it's and in part of the narrative of sanatan dharm as this pure religion that has existed from time immemorial is also a specific narrative they are building up of muslims for example again quoting from your book you write integral to the narrative was a depiction of muslim men as the other libidinous sexually yeah. dissipated and voluptuously lustful from whom hindu women had to be protected at all costs and later you write how the hindu nationalist organization like geeta press called on hindu women not only to avoid lag bangles which yeah. uh, you know those guys made but also not to board horse carts written driven by muslims not to keep muslim servants not to invite muslim prostitutes yeah. or singers and joyous occasion not to buy household items from uh, muslims and so on and so forth and so it's not just a cultural uh, narrative of uh, the saving your women from the lustful muslim male but there's also the economic purpose yeah. of cutting off patronage from muslim yeah. so you find actually lot lot for is happening you see the roots there you know during even on uh, hindu court bill maybe we'll discuss it later but mm. you find that um, similar thing was happening as far as the love jihad and all mm. uh, similar arguments were happening and uh, so muslims kept coming to their narrative one way or the other when it, they discuss cow muslims come when they discuss women m- muslims come you know you protect your cows from the muslims because hmm. they consume you protect your hind women because men are li- muslim men are libidinous if it is considered a compliment if a woman is like a cow yeah and yeah and, and it also there is a deep seated inferiority complex vis-a-vis muslim men you find them that 
there is something about Muslim men, why are Hindu women attracted? And this I found not only in Kalyan, but even in some of the contemporary journals. For instance, there was this journal, uh, pretty popular, called Hindu Punch. Uh, I have some issues of that journal, and you will find that this is, they're constantly talking about there's something wrong about us, about our, about our women. Why are they so attracted to Muslim men? And they get into very graphic reasons, which one may not talk about, but... So it comes from a deep inferiority complex. Where do you think this insecurity comes from? Like, is it just a historical narrative of, oh, they invaded us and raped our women and all of that? Or is it also something contemporary where they find that Muslim men are just more virile and they're dominating? They, 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 that's, the, that's the narrative of, if you ask uh, any Pracharak privately, he'll tell you this virile thing that, you know, they are more virile, therefore they need four wives. So you, they have built their own world. <laughs> yeah, even if you ask them how many Muslim men they know in these times were four wives, forget four, even two wives, they don't have any name, you know. But this is how they build. And, and see, the interesting part is that how this narrative is still alive today. It's not only alive, it's doing very well, actually. And especially in the last six years, no, more than five years. Yeah, and one wonders whether there is any logical end to this or it's just a really great way to sort of uh, mobilize uh, uh, the troops, uh, so to say. L let's kind of now talk about uh, the Gita Press's rising involvement in politics from the 40 onwards. Because as you pointed out, when they started, it was like a cultural thing. They didn't really get involved in politics, even though Poddar was close to a lot of politicians. Yeah. But they didn't really get involved. And they, certainly they were never uh, uh, against the British in any way. No. But um, uh, there were a number of sort of hot buttons which came up in uh, as the 40s came on. And one as independence approach was partition. Yeah. Tell, tell me a bit about that. Partition, see, partition, uh, just like as I told you during the 30s when the caste thing came about, they turned, they forgot what the journal was uh, meant to do. Uh, 40s, it became more so. 40s, in fact, so much so that in 46, uh, one of their issue, which was called Malviank, had to be banned by the United Province government. It was so communal. It was so communal. It also had the last interview uh, given by Madan Mohan Malviya. He died in November. I mean, I, I believe this is the first time they did a special issue. They did a, a special person. issue for anyone. They never did it mm. uh, for anyone. In the, they have not done it till now on anyone. I mean, when Poddha died, they, they, they did a special issue, no? Uh, I don't think so. I must so. be mistaken, yeah. No, I don't think so. I, have, I didn't come across any. So, um, and then it was so communal and, you know, from... Uh, and what it was doing was... It was getting information from all the newspapers, their kind of newspapers, you know, many newspapers which they thought was kind of furthering the Hindu cause. And uh, they were talking only of violence and they were very selective in news. In fact, at one point, Podar says, some of my friends are saying that how come you're only writing about Muslims killing Hindus? Okay, so Hindus are also killing Muslims. He, he admits very grudgingly. The entire period, if you see from uh, 44 onwards till almost 47, they're very, very upset. They're trying to, especially the ones that realize that Pakistan is a reality now. There's no going back. Then they become even more so. Now they have added grouse that, well, you listen to Muslims have given them. So now is the time for us to turn to become a Hindu Rashtra. Okay, Muslims are gone. Good. Now we become a Hindu Rashtra. And then they find the Constituent Assembly, this gentleman Nehru is discussing Hindu court bill, which freaks them out. And uh, that entire period, 44, 45 to 47, till Gandhi's assassination or before Gandhi's assassination, it, the entire Kalyan becomes rapidly common. Issue after issue on everything. You know, they ran uh, um, uh, this one, Bidacharan Sukla's father, who was member of the Constituent Assembly, and again, party, uh, again, on the side, he was among this right-wing element within Congress. He wrote a multi, he wrote a serial uh, four-part series or three-part series on what should happen to Hindi. 
you know, and very, very particular about how it should not get polluted, how Urdu should be done away with. It, it was a long, uh, four-part series, imagine. So they were kind of bothered about everything. So what should happen post-47? Now it has happened. But on the violence itself, and then there's this famous, which I call a fake news in uh, about this Bengali woman, this pamphlet, which they produce all over, which gets noted in Bombay. We noticed in Bombay, Ilabad, Gorakhpur, and uh, frankly, who is this woman? Nobody knows. And uh, Kalyan, because of its circulation, it was reaching ordinary Hindu homes. It was, um, and uh, in a way, it became for RSS and various other organizations. It was a very easy vehicle to get their point across. In fact, entire 1946 Gorakhpur session of Hindu Mahasabha, the resolutions that they passed, you find Kalyan reproducing it in a different form as a set of demands that they had from the now uh, new India, which was minus the Muslims because the Pakistan had come up, which is like even now you find that those same things someone or the other is talking about, especially since 2014. And what kind of struck me was, like, on the one hand, they're very frustrated because they're like, the Muslims got their Pakistan, but where is our Hindu Rashtra? Yeah. I think they use the term Khichri for uh-huh. what they were uh-huh. left with. And I love Khichri. I think it's great. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, there's almost in some places, I sensed a little bit of glee that this is an opportunity for them to push their agenda. For example, quoting from your book about Noah Khali, hmm. uh, you say, quote, the Hindu Mahasabha, which had dispatched senior leaders like Ashutosh Lahiri, Shama Prasad Mukherjee, N.C. Chatterjee and Pandit Narendra Nath Das to Noah Khali for relief work, did not fail to see the long-term gain for the community. Mm-hmm. And now you quote within that, yeah. Notwithstanding this great catastrophe, it is a matter of satisfaction to the members of the relief committee to see a keen sense of fellow feeling now awakened amongst all Hindus in every province of India. Stop quote. So people are being slaughtered on both sides. Yeah. And they see it as an opportunity to continue with the polarization. See, had Gandhi not been assassinated in 48, these guys would have been in power much, much earlier. Maybe not in 51, 52. They would have come to power maybe by 57 or max 62 election. Really? Yeah. This Gandhi uh, assassination Give them, it was set back for 20 years. So you find them coming back to, uh, you know, making noise only in the 60s, sometime, you know, 65 election, Jansang. Otherwise, they were in the, they were there, of course, they were strong perimenic. Jansang was very much there, but they never posed challenge. And, and where and India? And generation of people, they just couldn't come to terms with this assassination. They wouldn't have won 47. Uh, um, uh, if Gandhi was not assassinated, these guys would have come much earlier. And uh, you know, that also brings me to the question of that, is our nation's destiny then from that time, the way things have unveiled and unraveled, purely a question of happenstance and dumb luck, whether good luck or bad luck is depends on how you look at it, mm-hmm. that there was absolutely just one guy who was against the stride and that was Nehru and he is a guy who happened to be Prime Minister, who happened to outlive all these other guys like your Patels and whatever. Uh, Nehru and uh, the whole lot, whole generation, I will not say Nehru alone because the whole generation of people, even uh, his lot of his colleagues, lot of his party men. But, but the other dominant political figures like uh, Patel, like Pant, like Rajendra Prasad were all sort of... Yeah, they were but um, still, the, see the larger, the, the new India, the fervor of new India which he wanted to build was very much in the air. There were a lot of people who subscribed to that belief. Otherwise, you know, these institutions that Nehru built, a lot of things wouldn't have happened. But yes, this... um, Otherwise, what explains in 2014? This is a question that I've been asking to a lot of people. I ask myself, this deep-seated anger among... Suddenly you discover among your friends, your relatives, whom you have known forever. Where was this all this while? Why did it need 2014 election result for this kind of anger? There has to be very deep seated, you know. Otherwise, now people don't even care when they when they abuse Muslims in drawing rooms or middle class drawing rooms or anywhere. It's no longer. I remember during Bajpayee's six years, it was not so blatant. 
it was, but not so blatant. Maybe there was no WhatsApp, so we don't know. Can I attempt one theory? Yeah, uh, yeah, about yeah that? please, please. Yeah, so there's this uh, sociologist called Timur Kuran who in 98 or 99 wrote this book called uh, Public Lies and Private Truths, yeah. something of that sort. Yeah. And he came up with the phrase preference falsification, yeah. where he gave the example of the Soviet Union, where he says that, look, the Soviet Union appeared to fall overnight as if the tide of public opinion changed suddenly, but it didn't happen like that. What was happening was, Everybody might have been against the government, but everybody was afraid to speak out and they all thought they were alone, which is preference falsification. And suddenly there was what he calls a preference cascade where people suddenly begin to realize that everybody else is also thinks like them and that emboldens them and validates their beliefs and then they can speak openly. And I think what uh, happened, uh, and I've written about this as well, what, what happened in 2014 was Because of social media, the growth of social media in the five, six years before that, a lot of people who I call closet bigots, but whatever, without using derogatory terms, a lot of people who felt a certain way, but thought they should not say it in polite society, suddenly realize, number one, that there are many, many more people who feel like that, who say it openly, that validates their beliefs, that emboldens them to speak out, and the shoe is on the other foot. And, and, and that's 24. I mean, that was just my thing. No, no, that's absolutely. It's, it's, I entirely agree with this. Otherwise, how did this happen? You know, this, like, you know, and it's continuing. 2019, for instance, everyone thought, uh, they'll be, you know, they'll be judged on performance. And as we were discussing before the recording, you know, demonetization <laughs> happened and, not a protest, not a protest that one knows of. Yeah. You know, getting angry in a queue is not a protest, you know. That, yeah. That's, Indians are used to getting angry in, when you're queuing up at the airport or railway station or anywhere or it's hospital. But, and it happened, it destroyed livelihoods, destroyed lives. And it's, it's, nothing matters to the people anymore. And it's a triumph of narrative and in a sense, it's a, it's a triumph of, of the Gita press. Triumph of the Gita press. You know, this is the kind of, they were, they were just, saying things constantly whether you read it not read it you will see it it's like the the classic coke ad you know they'll um, when you go to watch the hollywood movies in america they'll say drink coke eat popcorn there, there was some catch line which i've mm. forgotten and they will do it so many times that you will at the end of it you will say i might as well go and have something you know yeah. so this constantly talking about car women muslim the other and when you place facts before people, you know, people, the class that you and I belong to, and tell them, tell me how many Muslims that you know who have done extremely well in life, who have taken away a job. Damn it, I don't see Muslim kids in my kids' school, you know. Uh, how many Muslim kids that she has as friends in school? In college, how many Muslim friends I had? And what are they taking away then? No, and, and there's like, like I remember this incident with this... Uh, a uh, friend of mine who's done an MBA from a top school has an absolute top job in the corporate sector. And one day we were just chilling and he said that, Amit, there's one statistic which really scares me. And I said, what is it? And he said, you know, the, the Hindu birth replacement rate is so and so and he takes 1.9 or something and the Muslim rate is 9. And I just started laughing. I said that, bro, you know, it, it, this is not even something you need to fact check or Google oh. or whatever. It yeah. is just, just see yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. It just, Come it, on. It's just common sense that this is complete rubbish. And, and you find so many. And then you think that, no, they're believing this because they want to believe this. They want to believe it. And when you place these facts, they're not, they, they will not agree. They'll say, no, how where have you got this from? What is this from? You know, for, therefore, someone like, say, Pratik Sinha doing something, what he, which he does, it's like, really hats off I, to him. great personal risk. I mean, and he's great a personal hero. Risk. He's based on a great hero, if you ask sake. me. Yeah. I, you know, the couple of times I have sent him a few things on mm. Twitter, I DM'd him that, you know, and I found that he figured this out and it was brought in public domain. But then again, how many people are on Twitter? Yeah. It's the WhatsApp which is the most dangerous, which is uh, where all the religious jokes to everything and how quick they are when every failure which happens. Like that day Chandrayaan uh, first attempted in Go for purely scientific reasons, which is fine, it happens all over the world. But they took it in a completely different way. I got few forwards which said, why this is, uh, you know, this was, um, they gave it a new twist to it, which was the, they had no business to do. 
and 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 you will find that everyone and the enough takers for such uh, narrative no and and and, and also that a uh, depressing whatsapp forward there was about so many countries have moons on their flags but we have a flag on the moon huh. at which point i'm thinking what's the point you know what are you going to do with the millions of jobless huh. people in this country yeah. you're going to send them send to the moon? them nobody is worried about this it's it's insane to to kind of get back to the subject of the geeta press and uh, politics and uh, you know you brought up the hindu court bill a couple of times and i do want to talk about that and i also want to talk about that because there's a larger question i want to ask you hmm. which is Uh, a very difficult larger question which is uh, the relationship between the state and society yeah right like i had uh, rahul varma the political scientist on my uh, show a while back and he was talking about one of the two ideological cleavages in india uh, we have different ideological cleavages from the west uh, according to him the left right doesn't really apply here and one of those ideological cleavages is statism that what is the role of the state in relation to society and whereas the western conception the post enlightenment conception would be that you know the state um, uh, sort of you need the state for there to be society because someone's got to protect your rights and blah 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 uh but the hindu conception according to him and the conception which all these hindu nationalists and the geeta press people would share is that no society has existed from before the purpose of the state is to serve society which to a certain degree even i agree with but uh, but the kind of society that i view where individual rights are protected yeah. and so on is completely different from these people's vision yeah. of it but nevertheless their fundamental point is that our society is what it is for a reason and the state has no business interfering in it and and this greater philosophical dilemma is what is again at the heart of the hindu code bill what do you think about this yes in fact hindu code bill i was talking to someone while researching uh, that hindu code bill and he said that you know the greater suspicion uh, which hindus have or at least this prominent hindu group sarsas or bisindu parishad the mahasabha had at that point was uh, and it hindu court bill they faced successfully see the government managed to bring the bills eventually from broken into four but they managed the hindu right groups managed to uh, be the smart here you know why only this communities so this narrative of state only trying to do something to hindus not to muslim so there is a great rejoice about what government has done more among hindus than among muslim women i think or this triple talaq all the muslim women i know my friends everyone no one thinks that is such a big deal it's you not know? relevant to them uh, it's not relevant to age. them mm-hmm. uh, but you find that hindus are suddenly like more worried about muslim women than anything else they think it's you did this to us state did this to us the great secular state of nehru did this to us in the 50s so now it's your turn and for whatever reason they think triple talaq is the biggest problem facing muslim muslim women which it is not but anyway so yes they have a suspicion and they also have been very successfully managed to create cultivate this thing that state has always been after them and and 60 years and the entire congress rule years of congress rule are seen as basically anti hindu years and which they have successfully so every time so nehru has to be invoked therefore you know what oh, this happened the other day uh, amit sai is saying something about that in uh, kashmir uh, this happened because of nehru then the this where priyanka gandhi went in eastern up uh, yogi is saying oh, you know this was done during congress so this is funny now it's becoming absurd actually you know you know ne- nehru is actually the you forget nehru the real person yeah. nehru has become like a mythological figure like ravana mythological figure ravana i mean everything i think in dasera they'll put up a nehru yeah, there is a land that. dispute someone goes and kills 10 dalits mm. and you are saying because of their what congress ruled did in between you also ruled bjp ruled for long bjp uh, up what so this is becoming bit comical actually now no and honestly look what i would say is that there are a lot of criticisms that i can level against nehru's economic policies yeah, the congress yeah, government he was so full whatever. of his flaws yeah absolutely but this is good just taken it taking yeah. it to a new level like you <laughs> said you know you can't parody this shit yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's becoming a joke the some killing uh, happens and then you're blaming uh, congress rule of the 50s oh, what do you do 
Right. And and uh, another slightly, you know, and I found this very funny, you know, uh, it, it was a hot button once, it's no longer a hot button, but once upon a time, it was a hot button and a big cause for the Gita press, which is communism. Yeah, because, it, is, it was, it was, it was, in fact, they were worried because directly, see, it was most prominent in Bengal. And that's where the Marwadi's, the good old Marwadi world existed in Calcutta. Right. Sift to Bombay happened much later. In fact, even now, some of the big Marwadi companies uh, still have work out of. They dominate Calcutta. They dominate. Right? Even now, they dominate. And they even fund films in Bombay yeah, from yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, and this was a real chat. And you have to give it to them. They figured this out uh, much before. In fact, they were they were having this uh, two-part series article on Samebad in Russia and all kinds of... And somehow, again, this some deprivation you need to bring it everything down to women. You know, they'll say, ye communism mein na sabse jada problem mahilaon ke saath hota hai. And then they will say that one woman has to have relationship with 20 men. All kinds of absurd, unfounded, uh, you know, women exist for society. So anyone can have any kind of relationship with women. So they, and, and I think they realize that this immediately strikes a chord among the readers or people that, you know, this is what the new ideology is all about. And they were early on to realize that this is going to create problem for them in Bengal. Because uh, Bengal forever has been, you know, from right from the beginning of the 20th century, even before that, Marwadis have been there in Bengal. So you have to, they figured out, built good alliance with RSS groups, others, even saying in one uh, later, they're saying that we have to learn from the, this communists also, how they do these pamphlets. So we have to do the pamphlets, we have to learn. And, and do similar thing, otherwise we'll be finished. And, and the recent results in the Lok Sabha elections and yeah, yeah, yeah. very now, now of delicious course, for them. You yeah. know, you you mentioned their views on communism and how that went to women. And I have to quote this bit because I'm sorry, yeah. I find this so funny. If someone's yeah. offended, I'm I apologize, but I just find this hilarious. Uh, quote. Among several examples of Karpatri's regressive views, this is Karpatri Maharaj, yeah, yeah, who wrote yeah, Marxwad and Ramaraj. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Among several examples of Karpatri's regressive views, the most offensive were his statements on women. The new concept of women workers and the liberty it provided them, a product of the industrial revolution, common to both capitalist and communist ideologies, was considered a threat to the Hindu social order, where a woman was limited to the domestic sphere as daughter, wife or mother. Karpatri said, Lenin had challenged the concept of Pativrata Nari, devoted wife. In Marxism, since everything was state-owned, there was no need for a woman to be in a relationship with one man. As there were no laws of inheritance and private ownership of property, Karpatri said, a woman became like a bucket of water that could <laughs> quench the thirst of many men. Stop quote. This is how they used and, to and, write. Yeah, and, 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 and this man is absolutely revered by... He uh, revered... No, but uh, he became a bit of a... Later years, he became a liability. In fact, he was... He wanted... His whole take was the rural economy, a very regressive rural economy. Even Jansen, beyond a point, dumped him. I think he did well in the first election for... I got some six, seven... I got few seats. I think two elections he did. And then slowly he sank... And this book itself is hilarious. You know, it's, it's a fat volume, which I consider. You know, a lot of people have been asking me to lend me a volume. I lend me this volume. I said, "Well, if you promise to return it, this because, is Marx and Ram." Uh, this is. Is like, there an English translation of it? I, uh, in fact, I had asked Gita Press people. They said, "No, nobody translates." But for I can, uh, I don't know who will have the guts to. It's a fat volume. Just and for entertainment. Going in all directions. <laughs> yeah. And another thing I found very funny was how the Gita Press then strategized is that they are going to co-opt communism and they are going to contrast Russian communism with an Indian communism yeah. which they claimed originated in uh, uh, Hinduism and I am again going to quote a delightful book from your bit yeah. where you say quote two similarities were noted between Indian and Russian communisms the first would delight even the most serious of political theorists it said that Lord Krishna the originator of Indian communism dallied with gopis hard-working milkmaids, just as the fathers of Russian communism were involved with humble peasants and workers. <laughs> the second similarity was more to the point. Both versions were aimed at the betterment of the poor and downtrodden. Uh, stop quote. And it's and then uh, another writer called Charu Chandra Mitra argued yeah, yeah. that the basic mantra of communism from each according to his ability 
to each according to his need was already practiced in india through the joint family system <laughs> they were like but you, you, you have to give it to them for trying at least they were trying to get on to uh, for a, a religious journal to be aware of this danger all the, the way they dealt with this danger is very funny and is like very unscholarly that's but that's how they were you know but for them it was real in fact see this this side of uh, podar uh, which i wanted to write more i found few instances he had also become a big figure to in the in matters of business for marwadis for instance when this whole fight when this whole dalmia cement and acc thing is happening everyone is asking him to intervene because acc was a big mnc coming it would have destroyed uh, dalmia cement and what he does is he somehow uh, he he plays some role whereby they come together actually they becomes it's a so becomes dalmia sec the creators joint group rather than fighting with he's each like other. an elder statesman yeah he's an elder statesman and much later also even when you find the dalmia he was very closely associated with dalmia family even small matters when the entire separation took place times of india this uh, jains moved out from the father in law dalmia uh, sau santi prashad jain and the matter went to court the vivian commission report uh, they say that it is a limited com- it's, a, it's a listed company and they completely disregarding the shareholders they taking all the decisions and they saying how did you take the decision they saying because uh, bhai ji they told us and bhai ji is saying them in a very you know good old banya way of dividing property or business which is not entirely yours you have shareholders you you know you are answerable to them and um, so he was playing a big role even in that vivian boss commission report is full of podar actually so this man had a his foot everywhere you know so here's here's a question that uh, kind of strikes me and tell me what you think of this my observation when i finished the book and contextualizing it to the current times was that for much of the last few decades uh, the movement at the geeta press was spearheading with the alliance that it built together of all the hindu groups in the mahasabha rss and so on the movement that it was spearheading had success within the culture but not within politics it was a cultural success but not a political success I, and i'm just wondering whether today that they've gained this enormous political success there is also a slight cultural downswing because of the dual forces of globalization and urbanization that while it may seem that okay the project has succeeded could it be said that actually culturally as we become more and more exposed to the globe as we are say incorporating hip hop in a film like gully boy or as more and more people are getting aspirational in different ways than they would earlier and as more and more of india is urbanizing which uh, uh, you know tends to put people uh, uh, together more squeezed together and less likely to discriminate uh, because uh, they are part of those economic networks for self interest um and ag- again i'm just completely speculating and uh, i i think you'd be better i uh, i'm not really sure whether see all this has happened but uh, how do you kind of explain some of these people who also do i'm i'm just giving an example of friend i don't want to name him who is who is completely post modern in his when it comes to his choice of music or even some bit of literature but extremely conservative and have asked him uh and he said that it coexists for instance how does one explain the grand success of article 15 okay and kabir well, what is that movie kabir which, singh kabir singh so i was telling this friend of mine he said you know both of them have made money so what is happening to our society article 15 also made money it was it's a successful movie which is very serious movie well a lot of my dalit activist friends are upset over other reasons which is fine which one can argue but as a mainstream yeah, film yeah as a mainstream do. film uh, it has done very well and they, it almost coincided with kabir singh which again is supposed to be kind of a money spin or made some 200 crores so what is happening to our society i don't know we're becoming more cosmopolitan we're global as you said 
but uh, it's like um, what one of my another friend says that it's a nri phenomena which is now we see more here you know you want to make your money working for the mncs but when it comes to vote you want to vote for a guy who is like socially conservative god knows what he so this is some bit of it is happening here otherwise you know let's just look at all the nri crowd you know all of us have our nri relatives who like completely vouching for completely conservative policy they if they had their way pakistan would not exist uh, this they sitting in new york or sitting in london is very easy for them it would spontaneously say. combust <laughs> <laughs> so i i really don't know how this these things are happening to our society we, we are becoming so culturally this project as you said there is a down slide to it there's a down maybe it will happen because it has to happen because in last 5 years we have seen nothing and we have been seeing it even otherwise but now past 5 years have been very pronounced on your face like we have we are there you'll take it you have no choice you live it as someone other day said that you know this um, this guardian article on turkish intellectuals of what they did so they simply said your time is over you know to that good old uh, now bad world called liberals similar thing is happening in india but for how long whether um, this will continue whether people will forget uh, the the jobs their other things and continue with the, to be part of this project and vote for a party which only talks of religion talks of segregation talks of hate i don't know no what what you said is really thought provoking in terms of article 15 and kabir singh both doing well and it strikes me that it doesn't mean that in this large country with millions of people that entirely different audiences watch those two films i think there must be many people who watched both films and yeah. like them for different reasons like them for different because reasons. people contain multiple I, I, it's yeah. completely fox piece i said yeah how is this both the movies doing well because i guess if i'm again thinking aloud and maybe this is simplistic but Kabir Singh might appeal to certain impulses that people have yeah. and article 15 may appeal to the more rational side of and obviously what people True. like you and me hope for is that the rationality, the rationality wins out in the long yeah. run yeah so i'll i'll end this episode by asking you a question i ask uh, many of my guests on sure. whatever subject yeah. we're discussing that looking into the future and i normally say 10 years but in this case because you know your book has covered a century and all of that i'll give it a slightly longer span looking into the future over the next 30 years what gives you despair and what gives you hope about the state of indian society first the despair my despair is uh, because despair is that our institutions will be destroyed beyond redemption so badly and when i talk of institution i don't mean one university here one university there the larger fabric of the way the we supreme discourse, court the rbi the supreme court the rbi you know and the discourse the narrative and the, and the institution the discourse uh, discourse for all time to come i think it's vitiated for long long time and I, it's not going to go away so easily you have poison uh, and and i talk to my daughter also who's 18 year old university going girl and she tells me things which is not at times it gives me great i mean it makes me very very despair but then i also see bookstores i see i meet people who who are worried i meet very young students again at the same time who who tell you that they don't approve if you go for lit fest might not be the la- the exact um, answer to say because these are happening in very urban spaces these are children who brought up in a very different way but even in small towns i've been to few small towns also and i see there is some bit of um, in the long run i think the constitution to sum it up in the long run i think the constitution will be upheld we will and and the institutional like say for instance media uh this can't go on for long nobody will read you media also know media has lost its credibility while serving one party a certain government they've lost the credibility so i and at the same time even the main, mainstream media has failed you have a parallel media which has given us hope which is and what will be without hope you know and we have seen societies around us 
we have not suffered as much as Pakistan has suffered or Turkey is suffering or various other states. So, and they've come out of it in various ways. They've fought. So I'm sure people will fight. This can't go on. This, this, this sarad of nationalism, this whole thing will not go on. And our Kichri is a resilient Kichri. Yeah, our Kichri is a resilient Kichri. It has to survive. That's the only way we can survive, you know, all of us. Akshay, I'm so honored that you uh, gave me so much of your time today. Thank you so much for coming. It was a real pleasure, Amit, talking to you. I haven't had this kind of discussion in a long, long time. Thank you. Thanks. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, do head on over to your nearest bookstore, online or offline, and pick up a copy of Gita Press and the Making of Hindu India by Akshay Mukul. In this episode, we merely touch the surface. I have a few thousand words of notes, so it's a remarkable book with a lot of depth. Please pick it up. You can follow Akshay on Twitter at Akshay Mukul, one word, A K S H A Y A M U K U L. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A M I T V A R M A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in thinkpragati.com and ivmpodcast.com The Scene and the Unseen is supported by the Takshashila Institution an independent center for research in education and public policy. Takshashila offers 12-week courses in public policy, technology policy and strategic studies for both full-time students and working professionals. Visit takshashila.org.in for more details. Thank you for listening. Filter coffee is a fascinating beverage. You need to pick the right beans, blend them in the right proportion, roast them to perfection, and slow brew at the right temperature to get the perfect cup. Which is exactly like great conversations as well. You need to track down the most interesting minds, get them into their zone, and settle down for an unhurried, unscripted chat. And coffee for me is always, always, always best enjoyed with friends. I'm Karthik Nagarajan, and do share my table as I meet some of the most interesting people I know and sit them down for a strong cup of coffee and an even stronger conversation. Join me every Wednesday for a freshly brewed episode. This is not Frappe. This is the Filter Coffee Podcast. Hi, I'm Satyajit. Hi, I'm Racheta. We are from the Open Library Project and we host a podcast called Paperback. Paperback is a podcast where we engage with stalwarts and experts from various industries, suggesting non-fiction titles that contributed to their journey in a big way. We've had guests like Anjali Rena, Dr. Marcus Rani, Dr. Swati Loda, Ambi Parmeswaran, Apurva Damani, and many more on our show Paperback. Find new episodes every Wednesday on IVM Podcast app, website, or wherever you listen to podcasts.